Our first scripture comes this morning from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say that they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Someone might claim, you have faith and I have action. But how can I see your faith apart from your actions? Instead, I'll show you my faith by putting it into practice in faithful action. And our second reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are a light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a lampstand, and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, we say, thanks be to God. Oh, I woke up this morning in my body in the first state. Say on Jesus. Woke up this morning in my body in the first state. Say on Jesus. Woke up this morning in my body in the first state. Say on Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Do you think the first time somebody threw a ball at you that it just hit you? And you didn't you didn't know you were supposed to catch it? Probably. Do you remember that? No, but I can tell you when Wade was was learning how to catch, that's what happened, right? It just hit it just hits you because you didn't you don't quite know what to do when you haven't learned. But you let all learn pretty quickly. What to do? Catch a ball, right? That's that's something important that we all have to learn. When somebody throws something at you, you gotta try to catch it. And then you all knew to throw it back, right? That's play and catch. You all played catch before? I played catch with my dog and Yeah, with your dog. Dogs are really good at it. <laughs> So sometimes when we when we do something like that, when somebody throws a ball at you and you just catch it, we kind of call that like a, a reflex, right? You just do it without even thinking. You didn't have to think, oh, I better catch this ball when I threw it at you, right? Yeah, see, so you were ready to do it. <laughs> because if you had to think about it, you wouldn't be ready to catch it. It would take too long. So your brain just learns these things and does it without even having to think. And there's other stuff like that that we do too every day. Like what's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? Uh, we go to play ball. You go to play ball first thing in the morning? And I go brush my teeth and get dressed. Brush your teeth and get dressed, right? Do you have to think about it? Or do you just start doing it? Yeah, you do and what about when you walk into a dark room? What, what do you usually, the first thing you do? You turn on the light, right? Sometimes even if you're in a house that you, isn't your house, you, you start walking in the room and you start to turn on the light where it normally is, but in this new house it might not be in the same place, right? It's just a habit. That's what we call a habit. Things that we do without even thinking about it. And especially in the morning, your brain's still kind of sleepy. That's what you know your real habits are, right? What's the first thing you do? Know? You get out of bed, brush your teeth, go to the bathroom, get dressed. You don't have to do too much thinking for that. It's just a habit. And so there's lots of things we do by habit or by reflex. And we want to make sure all of those are good things, right? Jesus tells us, you know, you know Jesus? You remember that guy? Yeah. He was really smart. He had God's spirit in him. He was God in people form. And he said, you want to shine your light all the time. What do you think that means? Thank you. 
too, that we're all still working on, grown-ups and everybody, is to let those, those things that shine our light become habits, become things that we don't even have to think about, that we just do. So what's the habit when you work? What are you supposed to say? <laughs> right? That's a habit. And that's a good habit to learn. It's very polite. Like coming to church. That's a habit we have to learn how to do. And so the only way to, to get something, a habit, to become a habit so you don't have to think about it is just to do it a lot until you don't have to think about it anymore. So that's what we're all we're still working on together is just to shine our light in different ways, be nice, say nice things, help people so much, do it over and over and over and over and over again so that eventually we don't even have to think about it. It's our first thing that we do when we see somebody that needs help, we help them. When we, when we meet somebody who looks like they're having a bad day, we try to lift them up and say something nice. That's our first instinct always. But it takes a lot of practice, right? Just like it took probably a hundred times of trying to catch a ball before you could do it. We got to just keep working at it. And we, like I said, all the grown-ups are still working on this stuff too. So we can help each other. And one of the best things we can do is to pray that God would help us each day do this. And I think one of the best prayers to pray in the morning, if we can make learn that to be a habit, practice it every morning, maybe that's the first thing you should do. While you're brushing your teeth, you can say, God, help me make life better for other people today. Help me make other people feel good today. And just see what happens. I think we should pray that right now. Okay. Go for it. We're going to pray. And then you can put, you can hold on to that until the end. How about that? Let's pray that prayer right now. God, help us make other people's lives better. Help us every day to shine our light Help us practice doing nice things until it becomes a habit, until we don't have to even think about it. Help other people see our faith in you so they would feel your love too. And we pray your blessing on all of these children that you would keep them safe this week and bring them back next week to learn more about you. And all of God's children said, Amen. For our time of stewardship this morning, I can't think of a better example than what we're talking about right now um, with all of our uh, using our faith to really live out our beliefs than the uh, program of the so-and-sos that you see all of these 150 more dresses before us. And as I mentioned last week, the so-and-sos were just honored this week as the Broome County Council of Churches Volunteer of the Year. And they did a great uh, video about the so-and-sos that I wanted to be sure we all got to see. So it is here for us to watch. Um, the so-and-sos is a group of ladies that have gotten together um, and our former pastor's wife brought that to us uh, she made the she had became aware of the program and uh, asked if we were interested and we all jumped on the bandwagon so um, and there in uh, in order to um, for everyone to be involved there's a lot of ladies that don't sew 
but this is how uh, we came up with the way we do it, um, assembly line. So people, uh, the girls have picked out their jobs that they're comfortable with and want to do and want to be a part of. And so that's how our assembly line uh, worked. And uh, we have been doing it. This will be our ninth year. And uh, at this point in time, we have uh, dedicated uh, 10,899 dresses and we're hoping uh, by this breakfast that we're going to that we will have hit 11,000 and if I know these girls we will. <laughs> The thing that really uh, works well for this is the fact that um, we have all ages, but most of our uh, ladies, well, several are, of our ladies have been 90 plus, and that's one of the reasons we went to the um, uh, assembly line, because uh, they wanted to be a part of it, and we wanted them to be a part of it. And uh, unfortunately, several of those ladies have passed on, and but new girls uh, show up. And the one thing I can say is we've been very, very blessed because with all those dresses that we have done, we have never purchased one yard of fabric. All of our fabric has been donated, and all of the elastic that we put in the, has also been donated. So we've been very fortunate, and we also we have had lots of uh, support from other areas. We make kits here. Some of the we some of us sew, but the rest that don't sew are responsible for making kits, and those kits are passed out to people who are interested in sewing who for one reason or another can't join us on a Friday. So we are, we are very blessed and every time we think we're running short of fabric, that door opens on a Friday morning and somebody brings in and donates more fabric. So, and a lot of times it's people cleaning out their mom's sewing room or something like that. Sometimes it's brand new fabric. Uh, we have been very blessed and this makes us really believe when that op door opens that we are truly doing God's work. This is a national organization called Dress a Girl Around the World and we send our dresses to uh, Rochester and that each state has its uh, central point and they go in there and missionaries that are going to other countries um, uh, go to their uh, state representatives and then they're, they're sent out from there. Uh, from what I understand, um, we have, dresses have been sent to 88 different countries and uh, so there's lots of little girls that wouldn't have a dress if it wasn't for this plan. This is a real love of mine and uh, the girls call me bossy and I probably, I probably am but our theory on this is that we want these dresses to look nice enough so that we would not hesitate to put them on our own grandchildren. So we're, we are very, uh, very much into having a, a pretty dress. So. And tell me what it means to receive this recognition from the Broome County Council of Churches. We are really honored and surprised and uh, because we, we never expected anything like this and truthfully we never expected that this uh, mission would go on as long as it has but we are absolutely delighted and we are and I am delighted for all the girls that have worked so very hard because uh, without the different ones uh, it would not happen. Okay. Does it? That's it. Okay. now to please pray for me as I pray for you. Let us pray together. Oh, holy, loving God, make your truth known to us this day and forever. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Well, last week we began a church-wide book study together on the book Surprise the World. This little thing right here by Michael Frost. And we had a whole 45 copies of them, and last week the last of those were taken. So I am really excited. I think that is just incredible that there are 45 people and families in our community that are interested in making their faith more of a way of life. That is just such a, an inspiring sight to see all those books disappear as we all, too, join together and following along. There's, I'm sure, some people here who maybe aren't really interested in reading a book, but you're here to hear about it, right? And you're, you're wanting to engage in this work. And so I just think that is a, a beautiful sign and blessing to us that we can see there's so many people that care about this enough to show up here on a Sunday, on your day off, and to read along during the week. It tells me God is doing great things in our church, and our community. So last week we saw from chapter one how our work as an average believer is simply to live questionable lives. That's what the author called it. We don't all need to be out preaching and evangelizing, but simply as we go about our life, we just want to be living in surprising or intriguing ways so that other people will ask us questions and that will give us a chance to tell them about how following Jesus has improved our life. We want to live so strangely that the things we do make no sense unless God exists. We want our lives, our daily living, to be a testimony to God's love and God's power. And so the way we're going to do that is by developing missional habits, as Reverend Frost calls them. We've got to find these regular rhythms, these habits that will transform our everyday lifestyle into a way of life that is questionable, that will get people to ask us some questions. And after all, this is exactly the, the vein of instruction that Jesus himself gives us. We are meant to shine our light, he says. No one takes a candle and hides it under a basket. What is the point of having a faith if no one ever knows about it? I mean, the point of faith is not some kind of golden ticket to a comfortable afterlife. That's not what this is about. I think we know that. And then we heard from Jesus' brother, James. He lays it out for us even more plainly. I love the message translation of the verse I read earlier. It says, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags, half starved, and say, good morning, friend, be clothed in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith fit together hand in glove. You can't have one without the other. Okay. Thank you, James, for that pep talk. We can't just believe stuff. We've got to do something with our beliefs, which is where developing some missional habits comes into play. We've got to take what we believe and turn it into a way of life. Now, I think it's important 
that we all understand what it means when we use the word missional or mission, doing mission work or being missional in our way of life is not just about recruiting people to our flavor of Christianity. And it's certainly not about getting everybody to believe exactly the same things we believe. Mission work is about giving the world a glimpse of God's kingdom. That is what it's about, showing people how God originally intended the world to be and how it can still be. Mission work is about living like we are already in God's kingdom. And when we live it, we will reveal it. We will make it real. We're not talking about saving people, right? That's not our job. That's above our pay grade. We're not talking about church growth. You know, if that happens, great, but that's not our goal here. Our goal in missional living is to announce and demonstrate what life is like under God's rule. And when we do that and show that to the rest of the world, that's theirs to take. That's their information, and they'll do with it what they will. We are simply there to reveal it. And that's why the book is called Surprise the World, because this way of living life is surprising. It's meant to make people say, what are they thinking? The author, Michael Frost, says, when our lives become questionable, our neighbors will invite us to proclaim the reign of God. They'll ask us questions. They'll open the door to those conversations. If our only habits as Christians are going to church and attending meetings, well, that's not really going to connect us to unbelievers. And it's not going to invite anybody's curiosity about our faith. So the trick is to develop some habits that unite us together as believers while also propelling us into the lives of others. We need these habitual practices, but we need them to not deplete us, right? We, need, we can't be getting burned out through this. We need them to re-energize us and replenish our reserves and connect us more deeply to God. Now, thankfully, the incredible thing about this book is he actually gives us some things to do. Five specific habits that he suggests we begin to develop in our lives, that he has seen do just what he says we should be working on. Habits that reveal the reign of God, but also replenish us. And these Five habits are bless, or bells, <laughs> sorry, bells. Bless is the first one, eat, listen, learn, scent. So it spells the acronym bells. For the next five weeks, this is what we're going to be working on, being bells. Incorporating these habits into our daily lives. Now, hopefully these first two chapters have helped us understand that complete faith is not just a set of beliefs. It's not a, a single moment of accepting God or even a single act like being baptized. Faith in its most complete yet basic form is a habit. And the only way to form new habits is to practice them. Now, if you're like me, you probably hear that statement. The only way to form a new habit is to practice it. And think, well, yeah, of course. You're not going to form a habit of something you don't do. But to actually practice a habit, 
is a really weird thing. Just recently, I got this experience. Our yoga teacher was telling us we should all be sighing more. Most of us become so unaware of how shallow our breath gets throughout the day that a good sigh gives us a nice boost of oxygen and just the sound of a sigh, she said, helps reset our brain. Sort of just creates a blank slate. We can leave whatever thought we were having behind and move on to an, a new thing. So she said, practice sighing. And as I was thinking about this, I realized I used to sigh all the time. And I know this because when I first started serving here, I worked in the office with Sarah, who some of you may remember, and she said to me one day, you sigh a lot. <laughs> and I said, oh, I guess I do. I never realized it was just a habit. But somewhere along the way, I lost that habit. I don't sigh a lot anymore. And I wasn't even aware that I had stopped sighing until our yoga teacher told us to sigh more. So I've been trying to work sighing back in as a habit. And I really have to consciously think about it a lot. I have to stop and think and tell myself to sigh many times a day. And it is really weird. But if I don't do that, I know I'll never get it back as a habit. And it sounds like it was a good habit that I should get back. So I am practicing sighing intentionally. And it's going to take a while, it seems, because I've been doing it for a couple weeks, and it's still not a habit again. It's going to take some time. And I, I think, just reading ahead in the book, that developing the habits of bells is going to feel the same way. It's going to feel weird at first. It's going to feel forced as we practice these things. It's going to feel like it's taking a long time of being intentional before it becomes a habit. But the only way to get there is to keep at it, to keep practicing, to keep nudging ourselves to bless and eat and listen and learn and to be sent. And as we keep doing these things, eventually they will become second nature. So this is my forewarning encouragement that it's going to feel forced and awkward when you start. But the more we do it and the more we do it together, the more natural and habitual it will become. Now, the really good news for us today is that as we foster these missional habits in our lives, they will bring us to stronger belief and deeper faith. <coughs> we usually think we've got to have our beliefs settled. We have to have it straight in our head before we can get out and do the works well. But really, actions have actually been proven most effective at changing our minds. When we act first, the thoughts come with the actions. In the book, he quotes psychologist Carl Jung, who said, we are what we do, not what we say we would do. Our actions shape our faith. Our habits shape our values. And to me, that is some great news. Because that means as, as we shine our light, as Jesus instructed us to do by showing kindness and being generous, we are not only revealing the kingdom of God for others to see, but we're also deepening our own faith. See, living 
surprising, questionable, missional lives is a win-win. It brings our world a little closer to God's kingdom, and it brings out a little more of Christ within us. So let's use this week, before we really dive into what the bells are all about, what those practices are, let's just use this week to prepare the soil of our lives. Right? That's what's going on in the world around us. Gardens are getting tilled. So let's prepare our lives so that next week, as we begin planting the seeds of these missional habits, they will have a better chance of taking root. Let's just do a little tilling of our souls this week. Let's just stir it up a little bit by simply doing something each day. Just do something each day in public. So not here at church, doesn't count. Not at home. Do something each day in public that is directly motivated by your faith. Something that is outside of your normal habits. Something that is rooted in your belief and trust in the living God of love. Stir up the soil of your souls this week. So that as we begin to plant these habits in the weeks ahead, the whole world would see God's glory through the fruit that comes. And our own lives and souls will be more deeply rooted in the love of Christ. Amen.